Good evening, friends, and thank you for joining us. We are this evening a YouTube premiere, and we are shared onto Facebook. And in our time together, we take a moment in community to read the book of Genesis. Please do take a moment to post a greeting, share a comment. Let us know that you are here with us this evening. And know how grateful we are for your presence among us, as together we read the word of God. We resume the story of Jacob, of Israel, and his sons now. Remember that in our last time together, we witnessed the grief of Jacob over Joseph, his son, whom he was led to believe by his sons had been killed by a wild animal. In reality, we know that Joseph is in slavery in Egypt, having been sold by his brothers into slavery. We resume the story of the father of Israel, of Jacob, and specifically of the sons of Jacob. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went in to her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chesib when she bore him. So Judah, the son of Jacob, we find now a genealogy of him, we find of his own offspring. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go in to your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother." But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went in to his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And he put him to death also. We're not told exactly what the wickedness of the firstborn of Ur, uh, firstborn of Judah was that the Lord put Ur to death. We're just simply told that's what happened. We're also not told about the performance of the duty of the brother-in-law there's a reference here to Deuteronomy, which is where that happens, which again questions should cause us to question everything that we have known about Torah, that these books are in somehow in chronological order. 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. If they are in strictly chronological order, then what on earth would there have been known about something from Deuteronomy here in the second half of Genesis? So what is this performance of the duty of a brother-in-law? The Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the Torah's expectation and charge is that if a man is childless in marriage and dies childless that his next brother well his oldest brother actually not necessarily the next but that his brother the brother-in-law of his wife takes the wife not as a wife per se but takes the wife as a sister-in-law and performs the duty of a brother-in-law to seek to bring forth a child through the wife of his brother But here's the thing, the brother-in-law knows right up front that if the brother-in-law and the sister-in-law conceive a child, officially in genealogy, officially in the accounting of God's people, that child will not be the father, will, will not be the, the brother-in-law's child but rather the child of the deceased brother of the man who conceived this child with his brother's wife. Which is why Onan does what he does here. Onan does not want a child that is not his, but rather that of his brother and so he makes sure that every time he lays with his sister-in-law, there's no possibility of granting offspring to his deceased brother. In other words, then it is not the duty of a brother-in-law that he performs. but rather something that is way more focused on his own pleasure from this moment. And so he also is put to death. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. Judah sends his daughter-in-law back to her father's house to live as a widow, not as a wife, till the time when the next in line would be old enough to perform the ancestral duty for the deceased husband of Tamar. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. 
When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to the sheep shears, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And when Timar was told, Your father in law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garment and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance of Enim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Sheila was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went in to her. And she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. This is a complex moment. Why is it that Tamar has done this? Well, the text shows exactly, because the next son of Judah is old enough that Tamar should have been given to this son, Shelah, that he might perform the brother-in-law's duty. But that had not happened. And why had, not, had it not happened? For the very reason it had not happened at the very beginning. Because Judah was afraid. Two of his sons were already dead. What if the third also died? Tamar acts in such a way that she disguises her identity. She makes herself appear to be a prostitute, a woman for hire. And she puts herself in the exact spot where she knows that her father-in-law will see her, but not know who she is, but will know that her father-in-law, who is now a widow, will know what she presumably is, and that she is there then for his pleasure, for a price. And sure enough, Judah sets a transaction into place by which he may have her for his own pleasure in exchange for a price. And in exchange as a pledge for it, he gives her his signet ring, his cord, that marks his identity and his staff, which is unique to him. He gives her these three things which will be able to be traced back to him until such a time as he will fulfill the promise, the transaction for this moment. And she, in turn, will give the pledge back to him. 
as it were, as receipt for the transaction. And oh, by the way, she becomes pregnant from that moment. A fact that will not be revealed yet. Not immediately. Until after she has returned to the garments of her, her widowhood. Which then means someone's got some explaining to do. And with some urgency. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, Where is the cult prostitute who was at Enam at the roadside? And they said, No cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, No cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, Let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. It's interesting. Judah has this concern of being laughed at because his experience has not been observed for she who was for him a prostitute along the roadside had not been noticed by anyone else there has been no such woman here says everyone else About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immor immorality. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet, and the cord, and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila. And he did not know her again. Three months after Judah left all of this to go, he receives the report that Tamar is pregnant, that Tamar is guilty of something worthy of death. And he agrees. He condemns her to die. He passes judgment on her that she shall die. And if it wasn't for that pledge, she would have. Absolutely would have. The only thing that saves her is when she comes out and tells her father-in-law, the man who made me pregnant is the one to whom these belong. Do you recognize them? And Judah does. They are his. And suddenly he realizes why his servant had been told there has been no prostitute here. He knows what Judah, uh, what Tamar has done to him, how 
Tamar has tricked him, and she, he knows why, and declares her to be more righteous than he. She is in the right. And so in an odd way, then, the father-in-law has performed the duty of the brother-in-law. And the son, the child, well, the, the offspring from Tamar will not be Judah's offspring. Biologically, they are. But legitimately, according to the standard of the day and the practice of the duties of the brother-in-law, they will be the the offspring of the firstborn of Judah and the grandchildren of Judah, even though biologically these twins, as we will discover in the next verse, they are, are in fact his own biological twins with his daughter-in-law. And he did not know her again. In other words, never again did Judah have any sexual relations with his daughter-in-law. Just the once. We'll leave off there and come back next time to the remainder of the pregnancy and the birth of the twins by their mother, Tamar. Thank you, friends, for joining us as we have continued our reading of Genesis and now we bring our time together to a close with prayer. We pray the Sunday Collect of this week and we pray the prayer our Savior Christ has taught us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan didst proclaim him thy beloved Son, and anoint him with the Holy Spirit, grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made, and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior, who with thee and the same Spirit liveth and reigneth one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. We pray morning prayer in the morning and in the evening. We read Genesis. Thank you for praying with us. Blessings to you now and always.